Which one are you? Sorry. Oh. Right. Oof. Okay. Nope. Oh. Okay. No. no. Nick, I think you have to mute your mute your your computer. Just doing exactly that. He's running away now. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, okay. Good. So um, so hi everybody uh, and. Um, Thanks for, for attending, even though it's online. You know, I know we're all sick of online talks, um, but um, uh, but we're also used to them, right? So so it's all it's all good. Um, yeah. So so thanks uh, for letting me kick off uh, this this uh, fourth microstructure conference. Um, I'm going to try to introduce something that I that I've been thinking about for for a few years. I talked about this I think last uh, last year as well at the conference. Um, and so basically the idea is that, you know, we have all of this machinery, we have a lot of things going for us um, in the Fuzzball program. We have a lot of things that we've, that, we've, that we've thought about over the last few decades. And now with the exciting new um, observations of black holes that we, that we have now, we have a new window in the universe. I think we have a real opportunity, an important opportunity to make a contribution to this, to, to this field of, 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 of actual observations, right? And I think that's a really important thing to, to think about as a, as a community um, and to, uh, to work towards this. So I'll be talking a little bit, and of course, as you know, this, this picture here is the first picture of the, um, of the black hole, the center of our galaxy in the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star. And so as you see, um, they found a fuzzball there. So that's great. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking. I'll be touching on various works, uh, past and present, with uh, with with a whole whole bunch of people who, uh, who you can see here. Um, and um, yes, so I'll, I'll I'll cite them appropriately as we as we go on. So let me just introduce um, yes. So let me just introduce what what I what it is that I that I think we have an opportunity for, right? So we have strong gravity observations, like I just said. So the first thing that we have is since, you know, for about seven years now, we've been, we've been actually detecting, directly detecting gravitational waves, right? So that means that we, we are able to see in ripples of space time, how black holes, how two black holes spiral around each other and merge together to form a final black hole, right? Something that um, is a, well, is, 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 a, is a very general relativistic thing, right? Because it doesn't happen in Newtonian physics. In Newtonian physics, two black holes would just keep, or two objects would just keep spiraling around each other forever. Um, in general relativity, they radiate and their orbit gets smaller and smaller until they finally uh, plunge into each other. And so we're finally able to see this. We're able to see all three phases also of this, uh, of this, of this process, right? So we have the phase where they're very far away, which is called the in spiral. And so they just kind of orbit around each other, slowly decaying, right? The orbit is slowly decaying. Then we see the very powerful, um, intensive, short-lived merger phase where the two black holes start coalescing, start becoming one. And then finally, once it's in this last um, final object, once it's formed this final object, we see it ring down, which is its exponential relaxation into, um, into some stationary state. And so all three of these phases are, are phases where we see um, where we see properties of these black holes, where we see um, intricate um, properties and effects of general relativity, and so also where we can look for effects and deviations from general relativity, right? Quantum deviations, or string theory deviations, whatever you want, to, however you want to think of them. And then we have um, only since a few years we have the black hole imaging, right? So we have the the M eighty seven image, which by now we're all used to, and then very recently just. Uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, basically, the, the, publicized, the, the new image uh, publicized of the uh, Sagittarius A star, so the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, and these also give us a new, this is the first kind we're able to, to, to see black holes in, let's say, the electromagnetic spectrum, right, where we see light that has bent around black holes um, and, and then traveled to us. 
Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of these experiments. We're going to hear more about these today, which is, uh, which is going to be very exciting. You're going to hear from people who know a lot more than I do. Um, but I just wanted to set, kind of set the scene, right, that this is something that is new. This is something that is exciting. And it's an unprecedented new window, right? So especially gravitational waves, it's sort of hard to oversell this, to overemphasize how, how new and how, how, how important this is, right? We have, um, for 400 years now, we've been looking at the universe with our, with our electromagnetic telescopes, right? We've been gathering light that arrives at, at the earth that comes from stars, that comes from galaxies far away. And we've inferred, been, able, been able to infer a lot of physics about the universe. And now we have an entirely new perspective on the universe, right? Instead of just looking at it in the electromagnetic force, we now have the gravitational force that's, that's coming to us, that's telling us things about the intricate structure of the universe. So it's, it's, it's not really a question of, of, of um, you know, will we see something beyond GR? Will we learn something new? Will we be surprised? But, but what will we see and, and how will we be, be, be surprised, right? In, in, in a decade and 100 years and 400 years, we're certainly going to be as far more advanced um, as, we, as we are compared to 400 years ago. So it's hard to overemphasize how important this, 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 this uh, new paradigm is really in observations in understanding GR. And so on the other hand, we have what, uh, well, what this conference is all about, but what, where most of us are, are probably coming from um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of research, which is you know, within string theory, within the fuzzball paradigm, the microstate geometry program, uh, but also you know, other related um, attempts or, or, or paradigms in quantum gravity and string theory to understand black holes, to resolve paradoxes associated to black holes and to, and to really get, get, get to the nature of black holes in quantum gravity. And so there's, there's literally decades of, of such work, decades of understanding black holes and so it sort of makes sense. It's, I think it's an obvious but very important question to use this, this machinery, these decades of machinery and, and insights to, to, to bring it to bear on the, the real observational world of black holes in GR and what we might be able to see in the near future observations, right? So what can we learn? What can we predict from the fuzzball program or more broadly, you know, black holes in quantum gravity? Um, what can we predict or learn that might be seen in observations? I think that's a very exciting question, but also a very important question. Okay, so that's sort of where I'm coming from, and that's my very general uh, introduction, right? And so the questions that I want to be answering in my actual talk are, you know, you know why and how? So, so first, why? I've sort of already touched upon this, but let me go into more detail about this, right? Why should we be looking at, why should we be thinking about this even in the first place? Right? Why is it important uh, to, to use our fuzzballs, uh, to use our microstate geometries in thinking of gravitational phenomenology? And then also how, right? How do we do this in practice? What are the things to study? What approaches can we use? So those are the relevant questions that I'll be, uh, that I'll be touching on. Okay, and so um, I'm gonna try to do this in sort of two parts, which is roughly speaking, two different um, approaches, right? So the, the first part is going to be starting from theory, let's say, and then going towards observation. So starting from the idea that, you know, fuzzballs are quantum gravity microstates of black holes, et cetera, et cetera, right? So really starting from the theory of, of, of why we started to think about fuzzballs and, and black hole microstructure, uh, and then working towards observations, right? And then working towards, you know, what does this tell us or what can this tell us about observations? So this is sort of the going from uh, string theory to microstates. And then part two, I'm gonna to try to do this sort of the other way around. I'm going to go from phenomenology and try to connect back up to fuzzballs, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a, in a minute. But the idea here is that, you know, a lot of people, maybe arrogant here is, is not, the, not the right word or it's too strong a word, but I think a lot of people um, in, let's say, quantum gravity uh, contexts are very, very skeptical about our ability to make a difference or our ability to say anything meaningful about observations. Oh, the deviations will be too small to see. Oh, you know, we understand everything that we, that, that we need to about black holes. But I think there's, there's, some real, um, there's some real opportunities here, and I'll give a few arguments, just I mean, hand-waving or not, uh, why I think we should, we should be a little bit more open-minded um, if, if that happens to be your, um, 
your, your, your point of view, we should be a little bit open-minded about why, um, what can be beyond them, black holes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. So first, oh, so first let me say, you know, please jump in with any questions if you, if you have any, just uh, shout out. I, I probably can't see the chat, but uh, someone else can shout it out if, if necessary. Okay, so let's start with, um, like I said, we're gonna start with the idea of fuzzballs and work towards uh, observations, right? Um, and so, uh, okay, since this is also the first talk in, in the conference, I, I have to give the obligatory mention of the information paradox, which is where everything comes from, which, which is where our whole idea or paradigm comes from, right? Um, the information paradox being that uh, you form a black hole by some gravitational collapse or, or merger or whatever. And so there's um, a bunch of information that gets trapped in the black hole, right? Whatever you use to form the black hole um, disappears inside the black hole. And so you can't see outside the black hole, um, you know, what, what formed the black hole. If you, if you get there after it's been formed, you don't really know how it was formed because it looks featureless, right? It's only determined by its mass and angular momentum, I would say in GR. This would not be a problem as long as we only have classical GR because then, well, the information is trapped in the black hole, we can't access it, but it's still there, it's not lost. Um, the problem, it becomes a problem, there, there, there arises a paradox only once we go to the semi-classical level, once we introduce quantum effects, and in particular, once we understand that there's radiation coming out of the black hole, Hawking radiation. Um, the problem being that this Hawking radiation is thermal and so carries no information about what's inside. What this means is that uh, after a while, you expect the black hole to be completely radiated away into Hawking radiation, into thermal radiation. This radiation contains no information. And so you've seemingly lost all of the information about what was in the black hole before. Um, this of course is something that we don't really like because we, we like unitarity in quantum mechanics. We like to have a, a certain determinism in the sense that information is not lost, at least not in principle. And so um, I think the information paradox can sort of be summarized by, by saying, by asking the question, what happens when the information in the black hole, how do we in a consistent full theory of quantum gravity um, resolve this paradox and recover the information? So the first thing you might think is, let's just, okay, Hawking radiation, this calculation, uh, you know, if you know the details of it, it's done on a fixed background, it's just semi-classical. Maybe you need to be a little bit more careful with the uh, small quantum corrections on top of this calculation, right? So maybe just small quantum corrections will, will solve, the, solve the problem and, and save the information for you. Okay, but then there's a very important theorem by Mathur and there's a recent um, follow-up that, that makes this even more precise, that such small corrections at the horizon, right? Small corrections to Hawking radiation, small corrections at the horizon scale, physics of black holes, these are not enough to resolve the information paradox. Okay, you really need to do one of three things, right? That's what this theorem is, is telling you. Either you say, look, Hawking radiation is still thermal, no information comes out. And at the end of the day, you know, at the very, very last bit of radiation, you stop the radiation and you're left with some kind of a, a, a very small Planck sized remnant um, of what, what was originally your black hole. And this remnant somehow contains all the information that, that your black hole had. Okay, but that of course means that you need to have arbitrarily small things contain arbitrarily large amounts of information. So this is not something that we're very willing to accept. Two things that we are a little bit more willing to accept are non-local effects. Okay, so I won't go into detail here, right? There's, there's probably gonna be more talk about this, but um, there are various approaches where non-local effects are important. Um, this, this is a loophole, let's say, in the, the argument here, because uh, the small corrections that we're talking about are local small corrections. And so if you have small non-local effects, this can, in principle, resolve the information paradox. And then the main thing that I wanted to, to focus on, right, is the idea that you need um, not just small corrections at the horizon scale, you know, tiny little quantum corrections. No, you need new physics at the horizon scale. You need large corrections. The horizon is no, no longer just a... Um, a featureless place like it is in GR, right? It is a special place where you encounter something, you encounter new physics, you encounter the fuzz of the fuzzball paradigm. And so this is really the, the, the heart of the fuzzball paradigm. And I also wanted to mention that, you know, firewalls is sort of, um, I guess you could see this as some, somehow also a way of encountering new physics at the horizon scale, right? But I won't go into more detail. 
the, the point here is being that you need large corrections at the horizon scale. And that's the idea of the fuzzball paradigm. Now, of course, I haven't told you any, anything about, you know, okay, so okay, I understand I need large corrections at the horizon scale for the information paradox, but how does this work, right? What, what are the fuzzballs really then? Um, what does the black hole really look like? Well, to understand that a little further, um, we need to, again, revisit what a black hole is and what it has. So it has a horizon. And as we know, if you have a horizon, you have entropy. Okay, so if you have some object that has entropy, then this kind of means, this kind of begs the interpretation as some kind of a thermodynamic system, right? So a thermodynamic system has some entropy, which is sort of associated to the ignorance that we have um, as to what microstate the system is in, okay? And in this sense, a black hole should be kind of considered to be a thermodynamic average state. So if we, there's, there's always the, the nice, um, comparison with uh, the air in this room, right? The air in this room is in some thermodynamic state. I can say, you know, has this temperature, it has this pressure, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are sort of the average coarse grain variables. But then if I wanna talk about um, the individual microstates of the atoms or the molecules in this room, right? Then I need to know a lot more information, right? So that's sort of the, the, the difference between the microscopic description and the thermodynamic average description. And in this idea, the black hole is a thermodynamic average description. The microstates or fuzzballs, right, are the individual microstates, the microscopic description of our system. And so I'm really using this as a, as a synonym, right? So one fuzzball is one microstate. And so as you can sort of um, immediately deduce, right, a corollary of this is a fuzzball cannot really have an, uh, an entropy, a fuzzball cannot have a horizon. And so, um, uh, so this gives you one very important property already of, of fuzzballs uh, that you would want to construct or look at. They cannot have a horizon because then they would have entropy. So let me just tell you, right? And this is one argument that uh, that I that I think is very is, is is very nice, right? You have um, you have a lot of entropy in black holes. Okay, this this is something that people say a lot, but but so there are some people who have who estimated this and plugged numbers in. Uh, and so you can estimate that um, this is in units of uh, Boltzmann constant, that uh, a single supermassive black hole, let's say, you know, 10 to the seven solar masses has something like an, ent an entropy of something like 10 to the 91. Okay, now if you compare this to the entropy of the universe, the visible universe, without the black holes in it, you get something that is actually orders of magnitude smaller, right? And so entropy, remember, is like the log of the number of states. So you're talking about not even just an order of magnitude uh, less states, you're talking about an order of an order of magnitude or something like this, right? 10 to the 10 to the 91 versus 10 to the 10 to the 88. And so this is really an enormous difference, right? If you think about what we've been looking at with our, with our telescopes, let's say, um, this is really just the, the visible universe roughly. Whereas um, if you're thinking of black holes, we're talking about a, an exponentially large amount of stuff that we have not been thinking about or have not been observing yet. So there's so many, so many microstates out there, so many states or entropy out there that we have not been really looking at yet. Okay, so this, this is, I think, one indication already that this is uh, an exciting piece of physics to, to be thinking about. Okay, so, um, but okay, I'm not quite at observations yet, right? So what I wanted to say was, you know, there's, let's say we have one black hole, there's an enormous amount of fuzzballs, there's an enormous amount of, of, of states that, of microstates that this black hole has. Um, however, we're only really able to look at or um, construct explicitly a few of these states, right? A few of these states call, which we call microstate geometries, right? So well, in general, we expect that uh, a, a generic quantum microstate of a black hole will be something very quantum, very stringy, um, very hard to sort of capture, very hard to sort of um, understand in any kind of semi-classical way, it probably doesn't really have a nice semi-classical description. Some states will be semi-classical. They're kind of like the coherent states, right? If you think of uh, harmonic oscillators or anything like this, um, there, there are always these special semi-classical coherent states for which it makes sense to think of them in terms of a geometry, in terms of a classical solution to some gravity or supergravity um, theory uh, or equations of motion. And so the, the main things that you, the main properties of these guys are gonna be, again, they're horizonless, right? They cannot have an entropy, they cannot have a horizon. 
they should be something that is that are smooth in the sense that we can trust whatever gravity solution, supergravity solution that we write down, okay? Um, and so they should look like the black hole, right? They should have the same charges or supersymmetries if we're talking about supersymmetric black holes as the black hole that we're trying to um, describe. Okay, so that, um, like I said, is only going to be possible for very special states or very in a very small corner of, of phase space, right? Because uh, in general, again, the most general kind of microstate is not going to be this very nicely behaved classical uh, geometry. And so a very relevant question to ask, and I think this is something that um, you know, a lot of people ask in a skeptical kind of way is, you know, what can we really learn from studying microstate geometries, let's say, about quantum, the actual quantum black hole physics, right? If we're only looking at a small corner of phase space, what are we going to learn from this, right? We're, we're, we're losing information about, or we're not covering information about all the other uh, states in our, in our phase space. <clears throat> okay, so I think in this, um, so going further in this, uh, in, in this vein of thought, right? Um, if you're in equilibrium and you're looking at statistical, statistical mechanics, and, um, quantum statistical mechanics, then there's some standard arguments, standard calculations that you can do that says that, you know, if you look at expectation values of observables, let's say some semi-classical observable, and you look at something that's a typical state, right? So you just take some state at random, um, then a typical state is just one of these random states. If you look at the expectation value of an observable on a, on a typical state, it will be exponentially close to the expectation value on the thermal average, which in this case is the black hole. So what this, what this is telling you is, is two things. One is um, the, you don't really expect any kind of semi-classical observable on a, on a typical state um, to be able to distinguish state, a microstate from a black hole. Um, and also that if you, if you can construct a microstate geometry that has a large deviation from the black hole expectation value, then it must be an atypical state. And atypical states are, are measure zero in, in the phase space. So they're not um, in a sense representative, right, of the, of the entire phase space. Okay, so there's a number of things, right? So this is, this is sort of, I would say the standard argument to say, we're not gonna really see anything um, if we go look at a black hole because it's gonna be really exponentially close to, uh, to, to, to the black hole, the, the naive, let's say classical black hole geometry anyway. So we won't see any microstate deviations. So there's, I guess, roughly two things that I want to say about this. All right, right, so this is what I said. Microstate geometries are atypical if there's large deviation. And so is it hopeless to see any kind of quantum effects in black hole physics, right? Okay, so, um, right, so question. This is the question. So first of all, I want to make a side note that what you're doing here is assuming a number of things that are not obvious, right? So you're assuming, first of all, if you're using sort of the standard equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics, you're assuming that black hole physics is always going to be um, sort of typical in the sense that it's ergodic, explores the phase space um, in a short amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. And so this, this is ignoring or, or you know, a caveat in this is that you could have metastable states, you could have glassy states where you know, glass is not, a, is not an ergodic system, it's not a stable state really. Um, and you could have this also in evolution, right? You form something by gravitational collapse. There's nothing that tells you that you're gonna do this and in, in you're gonna explore the, the phase space in an ergodic fashion. And so this might have um, consequences on, on, on what, you, what you think should be the equilibrium physics of this, of this uh, system. Okay, so that, that's just a small uh, side remark. I think more, um, more interestingly, right, even if this is true about the equilibrium physics, we should really, an, another, something that we should think about is, is out of equilibrium. Okay, and so here I think it's much less uh, clear that um, the standard sort of statistical physics arguments are going to give you that, um, that, there's, that there's no deviation from black hole physics. Okay, so I won't, I won't talk about this too much. I, I, I've Sort of, uh, I, I would like to, to to give a shout out to to these long string microstate models, which I think is a very exciting development, um, which we'll hear more about on Wednesday. Right? And this is an idea where we can look at the non equilibrium physics exactly of these typical states and see deviations from black hole physics. 
something that we can do, um, so I, I'm not gonna say more about this, right? This is gonna be a talk about that. So something that we can do also in the, um, in the microstate geometry program uh, ourselves, and I think this is, this, so this is like a, a goalpost, let's say that I wanna set up, right? Um, is that why don't we go and explicitly see this in some system where we can do the explicit um, statistical physics over microstate geometries? And so in particular, right, um, one point functions are kind of like where this idea of typical state is, is the average of the black hole, uh, is corresponds to the average of the black hole comes from, right? And so in the D1, D5 system, uh, Raju and Srivastava have, have explain this, I've calculated these one point functions, but we have not really calculated these, um, these two point functions, right? And so why two point functions? Well, two point functions is like a response. It's like perturbing the system. Right? It's, it's like moving out of equilibrium. The one point function probes the equilibrium physics of the state, while the two point function probes sort of how the state reacts to perturbations. And so why don't we calculate two point functions in a system where we have all of the microstate geometry, we have all the fuzzballs, and then average over these and see if this gives you something different than the black hole um, expectation. And so this is something that we could, we could do in principle, at least in the D1, D5 system where all of the geometries are known, all of the microstates are known. So I think this, is a, this would be a very interesting thing to, to think about. Um, but let's go, let's go maybe even further and, and, and finally make a, uh, make a contact with, with the observations, right? I think even if you're very skeptical, skeptical about um, seeing even small perturbations, let's say, of microstates, um, and that you think that everything will be very, very close to the black hole, um, to the black hole average limit, let's say, there's still the final phases of black hole mergers that you that we need to think about, and I think this is also a very important. Um, goalpost, let's say, right, for this whole program of understanding quantum gravity in, in black hole observations is to try to get a hold of this, of this very complicated, very strong gravity phase of, uh, of, of binary black hole mergers, right? So just to, just to um, recap what this is, right, this is, this is really where the two black holes um, Start to start to overlap, right? If these are your two black holes, then the horizons start to overlap, and really, what happens is you're you're forming um, a new um, horizon that that's going to be your final black hole horizon, right? And so at this phase, right, your horizons start overlapping in quotation marks, and the the gravity is very strong. If you're doing GR, then you need to do numerical GR to get a hold of this uh, of this system. You can't do any kind of perturbative techniques, and so this is very hard to study. Um, but this is this is exactly where uh, various arguments can can point you towards the the idea that here quantum effects will definitely be in, important, right? So just to um, just to maybe recap why this is true, um, even in in the fuzzball paradigm, right? Um, it's very similar here to the idea of a collapsing shell, right? So if you think about not two black holes but just one black hole, if you want to form one black hole by some collapsing shell of matter then a question that comes up is, well, you know, when the horizon starts forming, the curvatures involved are low everywhere, right? There's no singularity yet. Um, the curvatures where this horizon forms are low. So why are there quantum corrections, right? Why do fuzzballs form and not just a black hole horizon? Um, and so the idea here is that it's not so much curvature corrections, right? It's not so much that we have large quantum effects due to curvatures. It's a completely different quantum effect, namely that we have enormous phase space. Remember these, these enormous, this enormous entropy that we have uh, that's available to us. We have an enormous phase space that's available to, um, to tunnel into. So quantum tunneling effects is typically something that we have in mind as being a, a small effect. But if you have an enormous phase space, then this can actually be a, a, a large effect, right? And so just to put some so hand-waving numbers on this, right? If, the, the, the probability to tunnel into an individual fuzzball is something like e to the minus s, right, s being the entropy, um, then of course this is vanishingly small, but if there's e to the s fuzzballs, an enormous amount of fuzzball to, to available to tunnel into, then the total tunneling probability to tunnel into fuzzballs as a whole into, into microstates and not form a horizon is going to be order one. Okay, so here the, the idea or classical intuition breaks down not because curvatures become large, 
or anything like that. It's because there's enormous amount of phase space available to us. And so this enormous quantum phase space um, invalidates the classical description because we have quantum tunneling effects that take over. Okay, so this was something that was put forward by Mathur and then Krauss Mathur. Um, and so we, and we did a calculation in this explicit setup um, to sort of verify and, and put further numbers on this uh, for, uh, some years ago. So this is really, okay, so this was a collapsing shell that I was talking about, but of course the binary black hole merger, this is kind of the same thing, right? Once your horizons start overlapping, the phase spaces of these two black holes start overlapping and start becoming one phase space. And so this enormous phase space of the final black hole opens up exactly when this starts happening, right? In this, in this strong gravity merger phase. Um, and so this is where we, we should think about things like, well, can there be quantum tunneling signals, right? Can, can we see little bursts of gravitational waves that would otherwise not be there? Um, do these tunneling effects slow up or, or speed up the, um, the, the merger phase itself, right? Is this something that we can look at? You know, if we have hundreds and hundreds of, of black hole mergers to look at, can we do some kind of statistical analysis on this and see that, you know, statistically speaking, there's a, let's say the merger happens much faster than we expected in GR, right? This could be something that we look at in, in the statistics of, of many gravitational wave of observations. But in general, I think a, a very important question for, for us, right, is to think of, you know, how do we model this? How do we get at any kind of quantitative or even qualitative hold, hold or handle on what these possible quantum effects, what the quantum tunneling effects could be um, in the merger phase, right? And I, I just want to leave that question out there because that's a question I would really like to address, but I think it's a very hard question for obvious reasons. Okay. So let me go on to uh, part two. Um, so this is sort of the summary of what I wanted to say when I start from theory going towards right at the very end, I, I got to observations, let's say. Um, and so here, right, this, this is, this is, this is the, the, the key of the matter, right? We're thinking of fuzzballs as black hole microstates. And so can we see this, um, this microstate physics? Um, let's say that the most promising, the most obvious thing to think about is um, when we have very non-equilibrium physics, and in particular, let's say the merger phase in binary black hole mergers. I think this is definitely something that we should think about. Um, okay, any, any questions or comments here before I go on to the next part? All right. Okay. So now let's think about, or let's forget about the fact uh, that we have all this machinery to understand, you know, microstates of black holes. And let's try to approach the problem from a different angle. Again, let's, uh, let me repeat this argument that, you know, the entropy in even one black hole, one supermassive black hole is orders of magnitude more than the entropy of the universe that we've, that we've uh, seen so far, okay? There's so many states that we have not looked at in any kind of detail um, with observations before. Okay, so do we, do we really understand, do we really think, is it, is it realistic to think that we understand the entropy, right, this, this, this missing entropy, not missing, but this, this entropy that we haven't looked at, these states that we haven't looked at yet, right? Do we really understand black holes? And do we really understand um, or the possibility of not having anything else except for black holes and the compact objects that we know already. Right? So the compact objects that we know already being things like neutron stars. Right? Is it impossible to have other ultra compact objects, right? So ultra compact as in they're very, very close to being a black hole, but nevertheless, they don't have a horizon. They're made of, of something that is not, uh, that, it, that does not have a horizon. They're made of something that can sort of withstand the gravitational pressure, right? Are we sure that there's nothing else like that? So, to, to answer these questions, right, we, we need to turn, we sort of need to turn it on its head, right? So what does general relativity tell us is possible? Well, in general relativity, we know that uh, actually it's very restrictive, right? So if we have something that becomes more compact than a certain uh, radius, so there's uh, things like the Bogdahl theorem, right? As if you start compressing matter more and more, at some point it has to collapse and it has to give you the Kerr black hole. Right? Very, very particularly the Kerr black hole, only determined by mass and angular momentum. So this is incredibly restrictive. That means that if we look at some object that we know is, is ultra compact, right? very, very compact, it has to be the Kerr black hole in general relativity. And so that actually gives you 
a, a very falsifiable hypothesis, right, from general relativity. So general relativity is very falsifiable, right? So are there compact objects out there that are not Kerr, right? Is there something beyond GR and are there other objects? This, this answers the question immediately. So if we're able to point to signals that we should look for, which will tell us if an object is the Kerr black hole or not, then measuring these signals, detecting these signals is a way to falsify this Kerr hypothesis and to know that general relativity is not the final answer, right? So far, of course, we haven't seen anything that sort of falsifies this Kerr hypothesis, but it's something that we should really, uh, that, that, we're, that, that is an obvious target, right? Because, because it's so restrictive, because general relativity is so restrictive. There's not a lot of possibilities there. Okay, so how do we set this problem up? How do we, how do we find, how do we, even think about um, what the possible deviations could be um, to these Kerr objects, right? So if we, let's say I, I want to test, I want to see an effect of some ultra compact object that's not Kerr, well, how do I, what are the effects, right? What are the effects that I should look for? And so there's sort of two ways that you can, um, that you can look for these kind of uh, deviations from GR. Either you go to, um, you, either you consider deviations from Kerr. So you still have a black hole, but it's sort of a deformed black hole. And so either you add some extra parameters in the, the Kerr metric, which is by hand, right? It's not a solution to anything. Or you consider something that's GR plus extension, like higher derivative corrections. And you see what these corrections uh, to, your, to your theory do to the, to the Kerr black hole. Um, and then you look at the, the, the resulting black hole and you say, okay, this will give me some kind of a signal these deviations from Kerr. Or you ask yourself, right, and this is more the second question, right? So this, that, what I, the black hole deviations, this is more like asking ourselves, do we really understand the nature of black holes? Are they really only Kerr? The second question, oh, sorry, the first question, are there other kind of objects that are possible? Um, well, for that, we need some kind of model, right? We need to understand what happens if I replace a black hole by a compact object. So these will be horizonless because otherwise they're black holes again. Um, and there'll be some kind of exotic compact object, right? So echoes uh, for, for short. Um, and so then the question is, what are they? What are their features? What are their properties? And what are their observables, right? How can we see that it's, an, that it's a compact object and not a black hole? Okay, I think we'll hear more about this also in the next talk, right, by, by Peter Cardoso. Um, so, so these compact objects, these are tools, right? This is, this is what you, this is what I'm trying to convey, right? These are tools to gain insight into the nature of black holes or Kerr or, or the non-Kerr in observations. Okay, so now in phenomenology, what we, what we can do is we can consider what I, what I call bottom-up models, right? So either you take uh, things where you, again, you change metrics by hand or you introduce metrics by hand, so you can make wormholes that way. You just, you look at Schwarzschild or Kerr and you go in by hand and you do something with the metric and then the horizon's gone and it became a wormhole. Um, so this gives you a horizonless object, but you can also do things that are, um, that are to, to give you solutions to theories, right? So you take, for example, you take Einstein gravity, you add a scalar field or a vector field with some potential or without a potential. Um, and you see if there's solutions there that give you compact objects. And so this is how you get boson stars. These are sort of self-gravitating lumps of boson of scalar or vectors where they don't form a horizon and they have some measure of stability so that they don't immediately collapse. Um, and so this gives you some kind of compact object. But there's issues here, right? You can sort of imagine that there's a lot of different things that you can do. You can change the metric in many different ways. You can construct many different um, Einstein gravity plus stuff, right? You can do a lot of different models. How do you select models? Um, once you've selected a model, you know, do you always have a, a, a way of forming your, uh, your objects, right? So for example, if you want to, if you really like wormholes, you know, how do you form these guys, right? Why, why do you form wormholes and not the black hole? Um, and then, you know, can you make this object really, really compact, right? Because they have to mimic a black hole to some extent. And when you make them really, really compact, do you still have a stable object? Right? This is, for example, a problem with boson stars. You can't make them arbitrarily compact or they are going to collapse into, into black holes. Okay, and so in, in any model, right, as, as is always true, you're gonna have features which are sort of the interesting properties of your model that you wanna look at and that you want to understand what they give you in the gravitational wave observation as a signal. 
and there will be artifacts, right? Artifacts which come from the fact that your model is not a perfect model, it's incomplete, and it has some, some features that are not really features, right? There are things that uh, may show up in your gravitational wave signal, for example, but that you don't really expect to see uh, in the real world, right? So how do you distinguish between things that you want to go look for or the artifacts, right? That's, that's, where, you, that's where model selection comes in, uh, where you should be able to say like, okay, well, this is definitely an artifact because we know that it's, it's part of an incomplete theory or something like that. So what should we be looking for? And this is exactly where I think we can use a complementary, <clears throat> excuse me, top-down kind of insight, right? Whereas model building, you know, in a bottom-up way, right, effective field theory kind of way or whatever, is of course an important uh, thing to do. It's it's good to to take you know our point of view going top-down, starting from a consistent quantum gravity theory, and ask ourselves how do consistent ultra-compact objects look like? What features of them are universal, and what can we look for in observations. And so this is exactly where uh, microstate geometries come in, right? So this is where I think fuzzballs um, are, can, can really play a role, right? They are explicit solutions that, are, that we know are consistent um, in quantum gravity. They can be arbitrarily compact um, without sacrificing stability, right? They're not going to collapse. They have their own problems, which I won't go into, um, but, but this gives us an they give us an opportunity right, to have this, this nice uh, consistency insight, let's say, from quantum gravity. Okay, and there's alternative models too, right? So microstate geometries, fuzzballs are not the only thing under the sun, even in the sort of a top-down way. Um, and today we'll hear more about a, a different kind of model as well within string theory. Okay, uh, let, me, let me maybe skip the, the top part here, but what I want to, what I want to emphasize is that this, this process, right, is, is a two-step process, right? You need to study your microstate geometries that you have available to you um, in order to understand what their features are, what their observable properties are. But then you need to, again, distinguish between, let's say, features and artifacts, right? You need to identify the features of your microstate geometries, the features of your observables that you expect to be universal uh, among all fuzzballs, among all microstate geometries. And then you can go look for, um, you know, what are the signals of these particular features, right? So you don't want to be too attached to one particular model, one particular microstate geometry. You need to use your study of individual microstate geometries to extract generic features, right? And so one example that I'll come back to is, in general, microstate geometries break all of the black hole symmetries, right? This is not obvious when you start out, but then when you construct them, you see that this is just generically true. Right, so Kerr is actually symmetric, Kerr is equatorially symmetric, in general microstate geometries are not. And so you might wonder, um, how can you, can you see the breaking of these symmetries in phenomenology, in gravitational waves, for example, right? And so I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, so I, I would like to uh, move on to the actual examples. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that, it's about uh, making parallels with cosmology. But I would like to, just in interest of time, I'd like to go on to some examples, right? Because I think uh, that, that can really help to, to, to set the picture. Okay, so the first example I want to focus on are uh, multipoles. So gravitational multipoles, um, there are, okay. So multipoles, of course, as we know, is, is kind of like a, an asymptotic expansion. You think of, um, if you do an expansion of your potential, uh, one over R expansion in your potential, you get you know, the one over R term is your mass, the one over R squared terms is your dipole, and you get a quadrupole, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these um, one over R coefficients, let's say, are your multipoles. And in GR, it turns out you have two families of them, right? You have mass multipoles and you have current multipoles, which are roughly like your GTT expansion and your GT phi expansion for an axisymmetric metric. Okay, so the, the most... Um, uh, obvious of these are the, the zeroth mass uh, multipole is just your mass, and the zero, or the, sorry, the, the first uh, current multipole is just your angular momentum. Um, but you have an infinite tower of both of these. And for example, for Kerr, which is de completely determined by you know, mass and angular momentum, um, you have uh, two infinite towers of non zero multipoles. Your even mass multipoles are given by m times some power of a. And your odd current multipoles are also given by m times the power of a. Okay, so all of these are your current um, predictions, let's say, for these multipoles. Um, and 
a consequence or, or another part of this prediction is that your odd mass multipoles and your even current multipoles all vanish. Okay, and actually the vanishing of both of these families, both of these infinite families of multipoles is exactly equivalent um, to the symmetry of Kerr that's equatorial symmetry, right? So equatorial symmetry being the sort of the, the let's say top down or, or um, bottom, yeah, yeah, top down symmetry where I mean that, you know, if this is your Kerr black hole rotating around the Z axis, then it's symmetric if you flip or if let's say if you mirror um, the black hole over the equatorial plane, right? So that means that the top half here and the bottom half here are mirror images of each other. Okay, this may be something that, this is something that I think is, is, is not so much appreciated about Kerr, right? And when you think about it, or when you look at the metric, this is obvious, um, but then when you think about, you know, is this necessary? Um, does anything in my theory sort of dictate that this has to be true? It becomes sort of less obvious why this is true. So I, call, I like to call this an accidental symmetry of Kerr. And indeed, um, once you go beyond Kerr, um, so if you look at deviations from black holes, deviations from Kerr black holes um, in other theories, you often see that this is broken, okay? You often see that equatorial symmetry is broken. Um, whereas axis symmetry is a lot harder to break um, for black holes, at least. For microstate geometries, this is easier. So um, without making a lot of, without, without spending a lot of time on, on microstate geometries and their multipoles, this, these have been studied uh, in, in great detail uh, in these works for a variety of different kinds of microstate geometries. What I would like to focus on is the fact that, okay, so first of all, we got some general insights from these works. We get some general insights, which again, may seem uh, almost obvious when you think about it, but nevertheless, uh, is something that needed to be calculated, also made quantitative, which is that, you know, if you have microstate geometries and they approach sort of the compactness of the black hole, then their multipoles are going to be very, very close to that of the black hole, right? And so the small deviations of the multipoles of the microstate geometries of your fuzzballs are going to be set, right? The scale of these small deviations from black hole multipoles are going to be set by the scale of the horizon scale microstructure of these guys, right? And this makes sense, right? So what I'm basically saying is, uh, in an intuitive way, right, your black hole has certain multipoles, right, which means it has certain bumpy structure, let's say. Um, if I add a little horizon scale microstructure on here, right, then the, the difference in the multipoles is going to be set by the, the difference, let's say, this of or the, the, the scale of this extra structure that I'm putting on top of the, of the horizon. This is um, maybe obvious. And maybe another obvious thing that, you know, once you know microstate geometries, you, you see that generically all of the symmetries of the black hole are broken. Right? Axis symmetry, equatorial symmetry, these are all broken. And so you can ask yourself the question then, can I see this in observations? And so this is one thing, so I want to focus on equatorial symmetry. Um, this is something that we, we ask ourselves, right? Can I see um, if, you know, if I have some object, right? And now I don't want to think about a particular fuzzball, a particular microstate geometry. I just want to think about, I have some objects or some two objects that are going to merge. I'm going to detect their gravitational waves. And then I want to ask myself, can I see if these guys were equatorially symmetric or not, right? Because if they are, were not, then that means they're, they weren't curved. Okay, so what I do is, or what we did was we, we say, okay, we're going to parametrize the breaking of equatorial symmetry by the first multipole that, uh, that breaks this symmetry. We're gonna add a little bit of this multipole into um, a, mer a merger process. And in particular, we're gonna think of EMRIs, which is like having a, uh, a supermassive, so EMRI stands for extreme mass ratio in spiral, which means you basically have a supermassive black hole, right? Um, and a little black hole or other objects that is orbiting around it. And so it orbits around it for many, many times before it then finally plunges into the black hole. So this is a sort of a special kind of uh, merger process where you have access to a very, very long, um, a very, very long uh, uh, signal because you're sick, you know, this guy takes a long time to spiral into the black hole. Um, and so this is a very interesting kind of signal that we hope to see with the future space-based detector, LISA. Um, this is a very interesting signal because we can extract, we can, we can see it for so long, for years, literally, uh, we can look at the signal and try to extract precision black hole physics from this. 
And so in particular, how do you study this? Well, we use what's called the analytic uh, kludge. Now it's not really important what the details are, uh, but just to give you sort of a, a taste of what you, what you do here, right? You simulate this decaying orbit, right? Of this, of this small object into the supermassive black hole um, to some order, right? In your post-Newtonian expansion, you simulate this decaying orbit and you simulate the radiation that this gives, um, that this will give. And then you simulate how this, will, this radiation will be detected. Right. So you simulate the orbit, you simulate the radiation, you simulate, simulate the detection. And so in the end, uh, you can do some kind of a Fisher analysis, right? some kind of statistical analysis, to, 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 which will tell us you know, how sensitive are we in our detection to small variations of this parameter. Right? So you vary this parameter and you see how much does my detection change, how, how sensitive am I to, to changes of this. And so what we find is that, you know, we expect that for typical emeries, uh, again, detected by, by this uh, future LISA experiment, we should be able to detect this parameter, this is a dimensionless parameter, to within 1%. Right? So this is, this is precision black hole physics, right? We will be able to detect equatorial symmetry to within this, this much, right? Dimensionless, let's say, dimensionless uh, parameter of equatorial symmetry breaking, we can constrain to within this. Okay, now you can compare this to um, earlier uh, measures or, or, or analysis so also done in the same way um, of detecting deviations from the Kerr quadrupole. Um, now, for, for various reasons, you can, you can see that this is a, a much more precise measurement. All right, so the, the Kerr quadrupole, which is sort of the first non-trivial mass multipole, is given by this in Kerr. And if any deviations from this is found, or any, if any deviations from this are present, we can detect them to within 10 to the minus 4. Now, what I would like to, to emphasize is that together, right, this, these two things, these two um, constraints together form um, an even better constraint, right? Well, first I wanted to mention that you can also consider breaking axisymmetry. Uh, so for example, looking at the other components of the mass quadruple tensor, right? So I've always sort of assumed axisymmetry in my talk, but if you look at the other components that break axisymmetry of the mass quadrupole, um, then you can also ask yourself uh, how well these can be detected or what kind of signal these give. So I, what I wanted to, uh, so what I was what I was starting before was to say, you know, can I use these constraints on these two uh, multipoles to constrain models? And so one example is um, uh, just, this is just a random model that, I, that I'm looking at, right? But I just want to give you an example of how this works to constrain models or to restrict models. Okay, we have this particular model, which, we, which is called the almost BPS black hole. And we look at one particular kind of this black hole where we have a tunable parameter, right? And so in particular, the mass, uh, the M2 and S2 multipoles are given by these guys, which are uh, not really important. What is important is that when you combine the two uh, measurements, let's say, of M2 and S2, you, you see that basically you will be able to rule out this model or constrain this model as soon as it starts rotating just a little bit, right? As long as your, as, as your black hole is rotating more than uh, 0.1 in dimensionless units, then you would be able to see the difference between almost BPS and Kerr, right? So you, this, this can give you some very nice uh, constraints on models. That's sort of what I wanted to say. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, just try to give one more example yeah, I'm going to give one more example talking about um, some aspects of imaging because I talked a little bit about gravitational waves. Um, and then so in the last five minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, black hole imaging just to give you a flavor of that. Um, so again, so black hole images, right? We have uh, images from the EHT. This is M87. This is a very complicated process, right? So what happens is um, there's a bunch of plasma around the black hole. We'll hear more about this this afternoon, right? There's a bunch of plasma around the black hole. The plasma is excited, it's accelerated, and so it's basically accelerated charged particles, so it emits light. This light then bends around the black hole in complicated ways before escaping, um, and then finally getting to the telescopes on Earth, right, to form this, uh, this nice image. Okay, so some aspects of this are the, um, so two aspects that I want to focus on are, first of all, the shadow, which is like the dark depression in the center of the image, and the photon rings, which is kind of like this very light uh, ring structure around the shadow. Okay, so these are two features that I want to, to focus on. Now, it's very hard in general, um, actually, I'll skip this. It's very hard in general 
to extract geometric data from this, right? So like I said, you, you have very complicated plasma stuff going on. Um, and so we know that, you know, generically we will have a shadow, we will have photon rings, but there's a lot of the details of this image are not really set by the geometry, but by the plasma physics. And because we don't really know so much about the plasma physics, it's hard to also extract geometric data from, this, from these images. Um, in this sense, uh, I, I should mention that the shadow itself, right? You might think, well, the shadow, this dark region here, right? That's where light can't escape from. That's where light goes into the horizon. So this tells us something about where the horizon is, right? So this tells us something very, very detailed geometrically. This is true, but the shadow itself is not really a very good observable. Um, it roughly because, you know, we're doing interferometry, right? So, so we're not really doing, it's not like we're taking an actual picture, right? We're, we're doing more of a, uh, we're observing this more in, in frequency space and then converting it into an image. Okay, the point is we need to think of a, a better observable than just the shadow and it needs to be insensitive to the plasma details. And so um, a very exciting thing here, uh, which I'm sure we will hear more about is the photon rings. And in particular, uh, it's been argued that the shape of these photon rings, because they're so much like the shape of the shadow, they do kind of tell you a lot about the, um, about the uh, about the details of the geometry, and in particular, it's been argued that the shape of the n equals to two ring. So this means that these are this is light that has traveled around one full orbit. Uh, you typically count the rings by how many half orbits uh, photon has done. So you go one full orbit around um, and then escape. This is something that you can measure with a, a future uh, telescope mission, hopefully in in, in Earth orbit. And you should be able to measure this shape very, very precisely. And so this would give us some information about TR. If you can go even further and measure successive rings and their thicknesses, then the thickness of every successive ring should be uh, roughly exponential, should be exponentially smaller. Um, so the n plus one ring will be exponentially smaller than the nth ring. And this expo exponent is the Lyapunov exponent, which tells you a lot about the geometry. But this is going, this would be very hard to measure uh, in the near future. And so I just want to mention that you know if you look at if you look at um, if you look at various models, right? These are even just black holes. I haven't even think, started to to mention black hole uh, microstate geometries. Various models of black holes in string theory and beyond can tell you that you know various features of the shadow and of the photon rings are um, are not set in stone and will differ between Kerr and not Kerr, right? And so. It's if I just focus on equatorial symmetry, right? It's possible to have um, an equatorial symmetric shadow, but not an equatorial symmetric image, right? And so the question is, well, do your photon rings are they going to be symmetric or not? It's also possible to have an asymmetric shadow, like you see here, right? This shadow is not equatorially symmetric, but it's actually rather hard for for various reasons. And so then the question will be, you know, if you can maybe you can make this argument that uh, detecting asymmetry. Um, of the image of the photon rings of the shadow is something that you, we should be looking for in, in black hole imaging. Um, but then of course the plasma comes in and it's hard to uh, distinguish between uh, image and um, uh, well, between let's say geometric uh, asymmetry and uh, asymmetry that comes from just turbulence in the plasma, for example. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up then and just say that there's plenty left to do, right? Um, in the the two things that I said, right, is that we should look at geometries, microstate geometries, black hole geometries, whatever, directly, right, we should study their properties. And I, I touched on multipoles and some image properties. We should study some properties. Uh, one very big uh, open question about uh, microstate geometries is, is their tidal love numbers, which means how do they respond to uh, perturbations, right? And so uh, this is a very important question that is still uh, underway, let's say, and in and, and, in the process of being calculated, um, but it's very hard in general microstate geometries. And then, you know, once we have insights, we need to generalize these and say and, and understand what the universal phenomenological effects will be. And so I try to, try to emphasize that you know, things like symmetry breaking um, is an important thing that we can, we can focus on. Uh, photon rings and their universal effects can be something to look at. Um, and I'll just mention here very briefly that stringy tidal forces is another thing that I think fits under this, under this general idea. Um, these are new tidal forces that 
appear in microstate geometries that make massless particles massive. Um, and so this may have uh, far reaching consequences in black hole imaging, right? Because photons may become massive. This may have far reaching consequences when we look at the late in spiral phase, right? When the black holes come really close to each other and explore each other's tidal forces, uh, stringy tidal forces. Um, and this may give some, give some, um, some new signal. Okay, so I'll just leave my, my summary up here, right? I tried to try to tell you two different viewpoints of why uh, fuzzballs, why black holes in string theory um, can give us interesting information, interesting insights into, uh, into black hole observations, right? And so part one was sort of going from theory to observations and part two was starting in observations and understanding that there's this, this, this complementary viewpoint uh, that fuzzballs and microstate geometries and black holes and quantum gravity can provide um, just understanding what exotic compact objects, what ultra compact objects can look like. Okay, stop there, thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Daniel. That was great and uh, a very nice introduction. So are there any questions or concerns or people want to jump in? I had a question, but it's more like a comment. Yeah. Uh, then when you're talking about eigenstate normalization hypothesis and the fact that you, know, you expect the differences between microstates and the black hole to be over a to the minus c to the minus s, this is actually not about all the microstates. This is about thermal, uh, this is about uh, energy eigenstates. So right. what, what can happen is that, you know, you can have a system which has like, you know, again, a Hilbert space basis, which is basically uh, done, done by microstate geometries, which actually differ from the black hole uh, by much more than e to the minus s. But then if you look at energy eigenstates, of course, you have to combine those guys. And, you know, the typical energy eigenstate will be some superposition of e to the s uh, microstate geometries, which is going to wash out all the, all the effects. And, you know, you have the, the e to the minus s. But the e to, e to the minus s doesn't characterize the eigenstate to span the Hilbert space. It characterizes the energy eigenstates. So that's, I think, important because Raz's argument just talks about energy eigenstates. And those indeed, you know, I mean, I, I have no problem with them uh, by, because, you know, again, just because they're they are a superposition of e to the s, uh, e to the s microstates, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll differ, from, they'll differ from, from, from the black hole of order e to the minus s. But it doesn't stop us from, you know, using microstate geometries which differ from the black hole much less to understand the typical physics. No, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I, I think it, it depends a lot on which questions you're asking, right? So if you think of typical in what sense, right? I didn't really touch upon that, but yeah, typical in what sense? So if you're thinking of, uh, of, of um, well, for example, if you're thinking about, um, let's say, well, okay. So one one particular example is you know if you if you measure the multipoles, let's say, of some object out in the sky, do we expect those to to conform to the black hole typicality or not? Right. It's it's not clear how to how to interpret this either either under Raju's argument or or not. Yeah. Like, is this like measuring an energy eigenstate or not? Yeah. For me, actually, the, I mean, even more funny was that you know the result by 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 Roberto and uh, Paolo that that you know when you have when you have something which approaches the black hole more and more and more. It's, uh, its features resemble those of the black hole more and more and more. I mean, for, for me, even that's something which is, you know, hard to, I mean, it works out. I mean, I, I can see from the calculations, but, you know, I just don't have, I, I mean, I don't get the physics. I mean, you know, I, I don't see why this should be, this should be universal. I mean, you know, for the BPS right. microstates and for almost BPS ones, it came in that, you know, as you approach the right. black hole, the, the, the numbers approach the black hole numbers, but I just don't know why that should be the case for a generic black hole. I mean, I, I don't have, I don't have a good intuition. Maybe, maybe, maybe other people have. Right. Well, this is why I think it's it was useful also to 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 do these calculations in, in all of the microstate geometries that we, that we so, did, right? And to see this. Just want to see if anybody else has got or any yeah. follow up questions or concern uh, issues or things they want to talk about. We are going to have because this is online today. We are going to have a panel on Wednesday where there's going to be more you know in person interaction on this subject. So this is not the last time we'll touch on these issues. But if anybody else wants jump in please go ahead so so i have a i also have one comment in the absence of other comments um so first of all if you have like if horizon scale microstructure yes you might think that the energy levels differ by e to the minus s but it's still most important is really 
how would the microstructure change transport phenomena, energy transport for in spirals? So it, I would expect that, yes, you could have very, very soft microstates at the horizon, but the energy transport mechanisms that create viscosity, effective viscosities and hydrodynamic models could be very, very different for a microstructure. But I don't know, do you have any comments on this? Or? <laughs> No, I think that's a that's a great that's a great point, right? That's that's sort of what I mean by um, you know even if you're skeptical about equilibrium physics, which you, which you may be, um, we don't really understand which is like thermodynamics, right? We don't really understand the hydrodynamics, let's say, which is I think what you're basically saying. That's two right? point yeah. functions, right? From a CFT yes. perspective, that's two yes. point functions. I exactly. think Daniel made a clear point that two point functions should not be the same, and I think the mass gap is in the same category. So if you look at the yes. D5 system, for example, the mass gap. Is going to be one over and one over five for all the typical microstates. It will not be the same as the black hole result, which is zero. And so, so you know, the two point functions will never give you the. I mean, the, the, don't have to give you the thermal average. I mean, all the arguments yes. by uh, about, about averaging is about one point functions. And you yes. know, Daniel made a very clear point that you know two point functions should be different. And I think Nick, you, what you have in mind is exactly a two point function. Right. Yeah. And here, well, here, I think it's part of it. But uh, there's another question. Just I also want to raise more generally, Emery's. Um, how, to, how much is the signal going to be affected by an accretion disk? Uh, I mean, where is this? You said it orbits for a very, very long time, but is mm -hmm. that that's presumably outside the innermost stable circular orbit? Right. Or, yes, yes, yes. So, so uh, is the Emory data going to be horribly cluttered by accretion disks? Is I guess the question. Right. Okay. So, so let me first uh, maybe maybe comment uh, on 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 Yosef's point about these two point functions, right? Because that, that's a different, uh, that's really a different question. So, so I, yeah, I think, I think you're right. The two point functions, we should, uh, we should think about these. And I think we have a, at least in principle, an opportunity to do this in, in the lunar method geometries, because this is where we have all of the geometries and we can do it directly in supergravity, right? So we don't even need to do an averaging in the CFT because then maybe it's not clear uh, how this, how these two point functions translate, right? To, uh, to gravity microstates, but the, um, but I think here we we have a we have a we have an opportunity to do this in in supergravity to see how this two, this averaging of two point functions may um, may differ from uh, from from some. But we know from average. the CFT that they must differ. I mean, because in the CFT we know that the two point function has a mass gap which is one over one over and one over five in whatever state you take, just because it's a system in a box, so it must have a mass gap which is one over and one over five. It cannot be smaller than that. It's just you know right. Very, so, no. so it must differ. It's almost by construct. I mean, it's almost you know because of ADS CFT, you know that it must be different. No, no, no. I, I don't know if I agree with that. But, okay. but my point about but but well, well, not using the CFT. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Well, that was that was Emil, right? <laughs> shoot me. Yeah. Why don't you jump? Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. So the so I think one has to distinguish two different phenomena. So in the um, in the ADS-3 conformal field theories, uh, there's, there's definitely one scale, which is N1, N5, um, which is the scale of some uh, typical excitation uh, of the CFT on short time scales. But on scrambling time scales, I think you expect uh, that, that uh, uh, you start mixing in between different microstates and there the gaps, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be exponentially small. It's very hard to get exponentially small gaps from, you know, finite gaps. I mean, I just, I mean, I think we should perhaps we can keep it for um, the, the later. Okay. So okay. Save, save this for the discussion because it'd be nice okay. to have a little bit of a break before Vito starts. So if there are any other quick questions, otherwise we'll, we should wrap it up and take a 20 minute break. Any other quick questions or comments? I think these kinds of issues will be very interesting to thrash out in, in the in person meeting so we can have a bit more dynamic to it. No croissants. Okay. Well, let's yeah. thank Dan. That was very nice. Um, Okay, so it was a comment. We can throw croissants at each other if we're in the person. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, looking so forward anyway. to it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Anyway, thanks a lot, Daniel. Let's thank you, Daniel. Excellent, and we will. Uh...